My name is Connor Goodwin, and I'm ProPublica's Interim Director of Communications. Welcome to How Ransomware is Fueling an Economy of Extortion. For those new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. Hundreds of businesses have been grappling with the repercussions of a ransomware attack on software provi provider Kaseya over the holiday weekend. The hackers then demanded $70 million in Bitcoin to restore data they are holding for ransom. This hack is just the latest and one of the most dramatic in a series of high profile ransomware attacks this year. ProPublica has been investigating ransomware since 2019. For a conversation today, we have gathered a panel of experts to address the growing menace of ransomware and answer your questions. Renee Dudley is a tech reporter at ProPublica. She was the lead reporter on ProPublica's 2019 series about ransomware, the extortion economy. Before joining ProPublica in 2018, she was a member of the enterprise team at Reuters, where she reported extensively on issues with college entr entrance exams. Jeff Cow is a com computational journalist at ProPublica who uses data science to cover technology and artificial intelligence. John Reed Stark is president of John Reed Stark Consulting, LLC. And over the last 25 years, his name has become synonymous with data breach response, cybersecurity, and digital regulatory compliance. Thank you to our panel for joining today. Also, this session, this session is being recorded and a link to the video will be emailed tomorrow to everyone who registered. Our, moder our moderator today is Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Daniel Golden. Dan is best known as author of The Price of Admission, an influential bestseller about preferences for white and privileged students in college admissions. He edited Renee's series on ransomware and also co-edited a ProPublica series on Latin American asylum seekers caught between the US government and MS-13 gang, which won the 2019 Pulitzer Prize for feature writing. Thanks again for joining us. I'll let Dan take over from here. Uh, thanks very much, Connor. Uh, you know, we're here to talk about ransomware, which is one of the most pervasive of all cyber crimes with more than a million attacks each year. By, by some estimates, a business is attacked by ransomware somewhere in the world every 10 to 20 seconds. Um, one reason ransomware is interesting is because it requires the criminals to have two different skills, uh, hacking and cryptography. Essentially, the attacker hacks into a computer or a network uh, encrypts the files so they can't be accessed and then demands a ransom payment, usually in Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency in return for a key to de decrypt the files. Uh, it's appealing to criminals ransomware is because it's a, a kind of one-stop shopping. Uh, you know, most cyber crimes like a data breach, you know, they steal the, uh, the information like the credit card data, and then they have to resell it someplace else. In ransomware, the victim and the payer are the same person, so you don't have to incur that extra time and uh, risk of uh, finding another buyer. Uh, so those are a couple of my observations on it. Now we'll turn to the panel. Uh, Jeff, uh, why don't you talk a little about who the hackers are, how they're organized, and why they seem to operate with impunity? Yeah, um, so I think, you know, as, as we've all seen lately, um, and it has been the, the case for a very long time, ransomware has been around for... Um, earliest iterations, probably decades. Um, but, uh, you know, these cyber criminals largely operated Russia and, and former, former Soviet republics um, and elsewhere in Eastern Europe. And, uh, you know, since the very beginnings of ransomware, I think they've, they've really uh, begun to organize. Uh, it's, it's, be, it's evolved into this, this industry. Um, and, uh, you know, like Dan said, it, it's, a, it's a way for cyber criminals to make money predictably. Um, and it's led to the specialization that, that you would see in any sort of, you know, other maturing industry, um, you know, if you were to think about it uh, as sort of a business. Uh, and so these ransomware gangs are often comprised of, um, you know, like Dan said, cryptography experts, experts at, um, you know, intruding into computers. Um, and also, you know, sort of what you, what you would think of management as management, right? People who, sort of organize all these different efforts and, um, uh, and also in some cases, you know, customer service, uh, people who, uh, you know, help uh, their victims, uh, you know, obtain Bitcoin and, and, and uh, you know, pay, pay the ransomware organization. So it, 
they've become these, uh, you know, uh, very sophisticated and well-organized groups. Um, and it's been, it's been difficult to prosecute them. I think partly because, you know, they, they do, they do operate sort of, you know, in a non-state capacity in a country where, um, you know, the government, uh, for example, the Russian government doesn't have a lot of interest in going after cyber criminals who don't attack Russia. Um, and a lot of uh, these organizations, they, you know, they only attack, uh, you know, companies outside of Russia and, and former Soviet republics. Um, and uh, so, you know, the Russian government does, doesn't have a lot of incentive to cooperate with, with, uh, you know, U.S. government, other uh, victims' governments. Um, so, you know, I think Th- that is one, definitely one big factor uh, in ransom and impunity. I think another big factor was, you know, especially in the earlier days, um, people didn't really know how to deal with ransomware. Um, local law enforcement didn't really have the expertise to um, sort of, you know, track down the attackers. And um, now, now uh, you know, in the last, definitely in the last year, the, the federal government has really taking a, uh, starting to take a much closer look uh, and wrapping up their efforts to uh, prosecute, um, you know, ransomware attackers. Yeah, I think uh, 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 Renee's done some research on some of the drawbacks even now of, of the federal response. Uh, Renee, maybe you can speak a little bit about the, some of the shortcomings of even, you know, the FBI and people like that, as well as the, uh, the role of insurance companies as kind of enabling some of this stuff. Sure. Yeah. So there's two issues there and they're somewhat related. You know, there's the law enforcement and, and cyber insurance. Now, on the law enforcement front, you have local law enforcement and federal law enforcement and lo- local law enforcement is probably more likely to be a victim of a ransomware attack than it is to actually be able to help a victim. It's just not what they're equipped to do. Um, on the federal level, there's historically been a number of challenges. Um, one is the FBI has been has been desperate over the years to get victims of ransomware to to bring you know to 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 complain to them you know to have complaints complainants come forward for cases that they can actually investigate. There's a few reasons for that. One is that you know victims may be reluctant to report because they believe that law enforcement can't help them. Uh, they may be reluctant to report because they don't want their attack to become public. Uh, another issue is that the Justice Department has uh, prosecutive thresholds that they need to surpass, uh, you know, certain literal, you know, dollar um, thresholds uh, to authorize the FBI to open a case and investigate. And again, historically speaking, the ransoms have been relatively low, you know, in the hundreds or thousands of dollars um, per victim. Of course, all of this is changing now. There's higher demands. Um, there's the issue of double extortion. This is um, this is where the hackers will steal uh, a company's uh, most sensitive data and publicly post it um, as a you know as a means of leverage. So the attackers' name, uh, the victims' names are becoming public whether they want them to or not. Um, but other issues remain. You know, for one, um, most of the, of the attackers are located in. Um, countries that may be hostile towards, the, you know, towards cooperating with the U.S. Russia um, is where some of the most notorious gangs are these and these days. And those, um, and you know, Russia is not extremely likely to cooperate with U.S. law enforcement. So that brings, um, you know, that brings us to the other issue that you mentioned, which is cyber insurance. And, you know, I'll say that I, I recently spoke with a victim. Um, a, 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 a chief information security officer for uh, a, do- a group of doctor's offices that was recently attacked by Ryuk ransomware. And she, she, she told me something that I think summarizes the way that many victims feel these days, which is she was surprised that law enforcement, no law enforcement authority could really help her organization when she was attacked. And at the end of it, she said she was grateful that she had, that her organization had cyber insurance. And it's act, you know, cyber insurance has absolutely exploded in popularity in recent years. Um, You know, two years ago, we did a story about how insurers were, you know, readily agreeing to cover ransom payments. Um, You know, at the time, seven figure demands were unusual. 
now they're commonplace and the insurance companies are getting stretched. So uh, it's all interesting. Um, it's all interesting and fast changing terrain. Um, thanks, Ray. Uh, John, uh, yep. can you speak a little bit to the sort of consulting industry that has sprung up around ransomware <clears throat> as it's become a bigger and bigger deal? All, all these cybersecurity consultants, uh, forensic investigators, uh, data recovery companies, can, can you give us a bit of a, of a roadmap as to the, these kind of businesses and which ones are helpful and which ones aren't so helpful? Sure. Well, I mean, that, that's a great question, Dan. Finding someone to help you in this situation is like finding a plumber after a hurricane. There's still few and far between the experts, and they do charge very high rates on multiple levels. But just taking a step back, because there are so many legal issues involved, I'm a lawyer also. I, I teach a cyber law class at Duke Law School. And even though um, I'm a consultant, there's, there's so many different disciplines that you need. So the data breach happens or the ransomware attack happens, you're gonna need a law firm to quarterback the entire incident. Well, why? Why do you want a law firm there? Well, first of all, because there are so many legal issues, class actions, law enforcement liaison, everything really has a legal dynamic to it. But also because you're, what you hope to do is put all of the work you're doing because it's all in anticipation of litigation, let's face the reality, under the protection of the attorney-client privilege. So you'll have a law firm on top and then you'll have a digital forensic firm that the law firm engages. And that digital forensic firm will come in and look for indicators of compromise, work on the remediation, and try to get you back up and running after a ransomware attack and see what kind of backups you have and see what kind of restoration possibilities there are. Then if you wanna make the Bitcoin payment, you're going to have to hire a facilitator for that. And there are very few companies that will do that. Well, why are there, aren't there more of them? Well, first of all, because remember, you're negotiating with a criminal and trying to trust that criminal to give you this encryption key. So you really need a specialist who's worked on these kinds of negotiations, like that old Russell Crowe movie about uh, uh, kidnapping victims. It's much like that sort of situation. But once you're talking to these facilitators, there's another dynamic that comes into play also, and Renee touched upon this a little. If you're gonna make the payment, you better make sure that that payment is not made to someone on the OFAC list, on the Treasury Department's list of prohibited countries or organizations, that you, terrorist organizations that you can make a payment to, because that's a strict liability violation. So if you make that payment and you make it to a criminal organization that's on the Office of Foreign Assets Control, the OFAC list, then you also could be criminally prosecuted as well. Now, OFAC has come out with some very ominous warnings about ransomware, making ransomware payments, including October 2020 guidance that specifically says that you should worry about this issue. So I, I did write an article about this and I, it's, it's a sort of a 12 point OFAC due diligence uh, checklist. So, and the biggest part of that checklist is working with law enforcement. So if OFAC sees that you're working closely with law enforcement, even though they can't really do anything to help you, but you're at least reporting to them, if you're reporting to law enforcement, then that will be a mitigating factor in charging you if you make this, this um, sort of payment to a terrorist organization. And remember, you're trying to prove that this um, evasive criminal is not on this terrorist list. And it's like trying to prove the, the height and weight of a poltergeist. So it's a, very, it's a very complex undertaking to figure out how to make the ransomware payment and how to remediate. And you see it with the Kaseya CEO just put out a video today on YouTube. You can watch it on their website. You can watch it and you'll see him. He doesn't really talk about the ransomware payment aspect of it, but he talks about just how many moving parts there are. And I was a little concerned when I watched that because the thing about these data breaches responses is that the facts change. On Monday, you might be thinking omega, on Wednesday, alpha, and on Friday, beta. The things change rapidly during these incident response things. So it's even, it's hard for any CEO, though it's valiant of him to do so, to get up and say, here's the situation. Because he or she is very, very likely to be wrong because circumstances change so much. Renee, um, you've written about some consultants in this field that are, uh, scammers you know they 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 purport to to recover the code for for companies to recover the keys they don't have to pay the ransom but really they, they just pay the ransom and charge you a free a fee can, can you speak a little about that yeah we did a 
2019 story uh, that particularly looked at two companies, uh, one based in Florida called Monster Cloud and the other based in New York called Proven Data. And there are these consultants that come on that victims will call after they've been attacked. Um, at the time, they were, you know, the first that would pop up on Google um, and, you know, victims would come to them and, and get help to recover their files. Um, these companies told victims that they could help them recover without paying a ransom. Um, but as our, our story uh, showed, they were paying a ransom, but not telling victims that that's what they were doing, charging them a hefty fee on top. So at the end of it, the victims were getting victimized twice. Um, you know, as, 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 you know, as time goes on, um, you know, and, and insurance becomes um, ever more prevalent, these days, insurance companies will typically give you a, you know, a list of preferred vendors for you to pick from. And, and these aren't on the, those lists. Um, but, but Monster Cloud still seems to be cheating people, right, based on that New Yorker piece. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, uh, they, they continue to, to, you know, act independently and, and get, you know, not everybody has insurance and they're um, picking up clients um, that don't and uh, apparently still engaging in their same practices that we've written about. Um, it appears as though, uh, at least in Monster Cloud's case, uh, their behavior has been reported to the Florida to the Florida Attorney General. So we'll see if anything happens from that. Yeah. Now, uh, Jeff, I want to go back to something you were talking about with this, the structure of these businesses. And it's interesting how these ransomware gangs, they kind of mirror typical corporations, right? I mean, I think they even have like human services, human resources people and things like that. But there's, there's a structure that's come into vogue that you'll sometimes see referred to in, in the press called ransomware as a service. Right. Uh, you know, where they, uh, they, they, the gang doesn't necessarily do the whole attack themselves. I wonder if you or Renee or John, any of you can speak to how that works and why they do that. Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, I guess it's, it's sort of the next evolution in, in the specialization of ransomware and um, people who, you know, are specialists at, you know, producing the cryptography software um, have set up a system whereby, you know, you can essentially pick up this malware payload yourself, um, you know, be, be uh, you know, intrude into somebody's network, uh, you know, uh, lock down their, their computers and then um, sort of share the ransom with, with the uh, software developer. Um, and so, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, obviously the originators get a fee. It's like a franchising model, but they, all, they also don't really... Um, have as much control over who they're attacking. Um, so, and so some independent hacker will just buy this or uh, yeah. on the dark web or something, they get into a company and then they find a uh, developer to partner with to, to launch the ransomware, right? And uh, Basically. Uh, mm -hmm. how do yeah. they split the money? Who, 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 who gets what percentage? Uh, I, I'm actually not as familiar with the percentages, but I'm not sure if um, John and Renee can speak I, to that. I think I can. I think the, the percentages vary, but that's precisely right, Dan. And Jeff, I think the way Jeff phrased it is, is, uh, is perfect. He said it's like a franchise. So, and that's, there's two, there's probably three major developments here that we're seeing in the last six months or a year that um, CEOs really need and companies really need to understand. And the first is this ransomware as a service is that it's much more sophisticated, not just because of this HR and customer service things, but also because of the way they're selling access to companies that they've already broken into. So that's, that's really an incredible change. Second is the sort of name and shame game. So in addition to saying, hey, we've encrypted your data and we have the key and you have to pay us for it, they're also saying, we're gonna dump it all on social media if you don't pay us. So it's sort of a two ways of extortion that are, and, and every day you don't pay us, we're, we're doubling the ransom. And every time you negotiate with us, we're increasing the ransom. So that's another big belt. And then of course, supply chains, using the supply chain model, whether it be all the recent ones, SolarWinds, Kaseya, it's just another level of evolution that shows you just how dangerous ransomware has become. And it, what's amazing to me is how often people, they just misunderstand that you know, hey, the reason why these companies are getting attacked is because their cyber is not up to par. 
And you'll hear that in Congress a lot. And that frustrates me because um, I work with companies every day. It's sort of like your health. You're doing the best you can. And I think when it comes to cyber, you know, it's cybersecurity, it's an oxymoron. So you, you, it's like trying to have an undefeated, your Golden State Warriors, and you want to have that undefeated season, but you also can't give up a single point. I mean, it's impossible. It's like sending your kids to kindergarten and, and not expecting them to come home for a cold, or when they come home with a cold, blaming the teacher and the school. So you have to realize what's going on in the area of cyber. At the same time, the ransomware as a service is developing, and the same time supply chains attacks are developing. The wrong way to think about it is that, well, these companies just don't have good defenses. John, are, are some sectors better prepared than others? And what, what kinds of yes. things, ways are they trying to step up their cybersecurity? Like, I notice you rarely see an attack on a, on a major bank or something. They, they seem right. to be better protected. We see hospitals, we see schools, we see energy companies. Right. Is that because they have lousier cybersecurity or what? How do you attribute that? I think you're right. You know, this is just really, you try to make generalizations because it's all over the place, you know, how, how companies are different. But I was at the SEC. I was the chief of the Office of Internet Enforcement there for 11 years. I was in the Division of Enforcement for almost 20. And financial regulation is extraordinarily burdensome. And in the area of cyber, the SEC and FINRA have really gotten in front of this and set up lots of guidelines and use their examiners to go in and, and really push companies at the level of cyber. So they're just less attractive targets. Not that they can't get hit because all you need is one small, you're only as, as strong as your weakest link and your weakest link is always a person. But you do see, and it's sad with hospitals and schools and municipalities who don't have the funds for personnel. I mean, we're, we're in the midst of a massive cybersecurity personnel crisis. You just can't find people. There are over, I think 3 million job vacancies last I checked in the cyber industry. For those of you out there listening, if you got kids, tell your kids to do cyber. They'll be writing their own ticket for their whole life. And you don't need to be a rocket science to do, a scientist to do it. So I think you see hospitals, municipalities, um, and manufacturing, which don't have the regulatory oversight. I do see more victims in that area because they're easier pickings. That doesn't mean that a financial firm can't get hit. I mean, remember JP Morgan, that wasn't um, ransomware, but that was a similar hit. Maybe Renee and Jeff, uh, have have other opinions. Renee, I want to, want to ask you something else, which is given what, what all you guys have described, the, the, the higher demands, the, uh, the, the double extortion schemes, the, the ransomware as a service, how can cyber in, insurance insurers can, you know, continue to afford to cover ransomware payments? I mean, is this, uh, J John, uh, to use John's metaphor, is it like you know selling flood insurance in, in, a, in a hurricane? Right. What's happening in the insurance field? Yeah, you know, in, in 2019, we did this story about the cyber insurance industry. And, you know, at the time, um, insurers were, uh, you know, would readily agree to cover ransom payments um, because at the time it made financial sense to do so. And now that ransoms are higher, it, it, it doesn't necessarily make financial sense all the time anymore. But at the time, the idea was that by paying, um, covering uh, the cost of a ransom payment, you're helping keep down claim costs. You know, it's the fastest way to get the policyholder back in business. Um, you know, an in, in, in insurance industry spokeswoman it, it, that we quoted in our story compared to paying fraudulent auto claims. It's not something the insurer wants to do um, because they know it encourages bad behavior, but you know, they figure it's not that much money. It's the path of least resistance. The problem is that all of these payments have contributed to ever greater demands. You know, we went from, you know, in the hundreds to the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Now we're regularly in the tens of millions of dollars um, for ransom payments. And, um, you know, at, you know, people are still getting cyber insurance, but as a result, you know, um, underwriters, they've got higher claim losses in 2020 than you know any other year prior year um policies are becoming more expensive um coverage terms are getting tightened and i think insurers are starting to rethink this business more broadly um in may for example one insurer in france said that they were going to stop reimbursing um ransom payments for new policy holders yeah I, in fact uh isn't it the case that, uh, you know, in this double extortion thing, when the when the ransomware gangs uh, 
when they go in and steal data, one of the things they look for is the cyber insurance policy. So if they see, oh, this company is covered for $10 million, boom, they demand $10 million. So, you know, the cyber insurance, uh, it, it fuels the higher demands, uh, higher uh, ransom demands. I'm sorry, John, what were you going to say? I was gonna, yeah, you're exactly right, Dan. You know, I think there's a moral hazard here. There are two sides to this story. I've heard both of them. I can't figure out which side I'm on. On the one side, you say, look, the insurance payments have created this moral hazard so that, you know, companies don't worry about, they make the payment and the cyber, the attackers break into insurance companies, find out who's insured and attack those companies. So there's that side to it. So there's a school of people who say we should outlaw insurance companies from making these ransomware extortion payments. There's the other side to it that says, yeah, go ahead and do that. And look what happened with Colonial Pipeline. You'll have a gas crisis or you'll have a different crisis. But in that case, it was a gas crisis. It looked like the 70s. For, for me, I remember the 70s when, you know, there were these long gas lines and it was very frightening for people. That was happening if Colonial Pipeline hadn't made that payment. So on the one hand, you might have some economic catastrophe that's terrible for the world with all sorts of anticipated and unanticipated consequences. But on the other hand, you have the idea that you're, you're, you're just making it worse by allowing the payments. Now, what I would say about cyber insurance, though, is I would add to Renee, you know, if you, I think premiums are getting, they're doubling, tripling in amounts. I don't think it's sustainable for the insurance companies to keep doing this, though they might just keep increasing the premiums. They're also setting up special requirements and giving companies the equivalent of a technological colonoscopy before they will pay. And then when you try to make your claim, the insurance company is going to say, OK, well, we're going to send in our own adjuster to, to review all of your current cyber to make sure that the representations you made to us when you actually um, you know, signed on to this policy, whether we're going to pay. Now, it's pretty disturbing when you call an adjuster after a cyber insurance incident, which I've done, and they've got a litigator on the phone with them to help them investigate the claim. They are ready to, for a fight. I'm not saying that they don't want to pay, but I am saying that there are more and more fights. So those are all the things that are happening in this area. And um, it's the perfect storm for a company who's trying to defend themselves as best they can. That's really interesting. Um, Jeff, can you speak a little to the role of cryptocurrency here? And why do these ransomware gangs all want payment in Bitcoin? And, uh, you know, given the fact that the FBI appears to be able to recover some of the ransomware payment in the Colonial Pipeline case, is that no longer, are, are these uh, cryptocurrencies no longer as uh, secure a hiding place for the ransomware gangs as they once were? Yeah, yeah. Um... I mean, I, I do think Bitcoin will still continue to be used. You know, I think one popular misconception about Bitcoin is that, um, you know, it gives you anonymity um, and it's not exactly true, right? Like all, all the transactions that occur with a Bitcoin account uh, are publicly available for people to search and analyze. Um, but, you know, I think electronic forms of pay payment like Bitcoin, like cryptocurrencies has really um, allowed ransomware to really flourish as a business model. Um, you know, the, I think, you know, the original form of ransomware actually, uh, you know, before <laughs> cryptocurrency existed, um, the, you know, the, the guy who invented the concept had people send their payment to like a PO box in Panama, right? And, <laughs> you know, so that was much more traceable and, and, and sort of, you know, when you think about the concept of a ransom, um, when you think about like movies uh, portraying that, you know, the, the, the sort of exchange of the thing for the money was always a dicey proposition, right? And, and so the cryptocurrency has really made that a lot easier, um, even though, you know, you know, DOJ can, you know, shut sort of, not, not exactly shut down accounts, but make certain accounts off limits um, um, uh, or, you know, treasury retirement through, through OFAC, um, you know, Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin can't really be shut down, right? You can't really like seize it like a bank account. Um, and um, even though you know you can sort of trace where the payments have gone, there's there's mechanisms um, called like tumblers or um, I forget another name for it, uh, exchangers that that essentially try to obfuscate where the payments have gone. Um, and so you know. I think Bitcoin will still remain a popular way for ransomers to get paid. Um, and it's, you know, easier than ever for victims to obtain Bitcoin as well. So, you know, if you say, hey, I, I want my payment in Bitcoins, it's, it's pretty likely that they'll be able to figure out how to get the Bitcoin to you uh, at the end of the day. I see what you mean. So, 
so to sum up a little bit, we, we've got this escalating crisis. We've got these gangs operating in countries that don't have extradition treaties with the US, so we can't go get the criminals. They're increasing their demands. They're stealing data. So even if you have good backups, you might, you might have to pay the ransom anyway. They, they, they've, they've increased their sophistication to the point where anybody can pretty much uh, go in and attack somebody and, and, and you know, they still, the, the, the big gangs still profit. So the question is, uh, what do we do? You know, so before we open up the audience for questions, why don't we go around the panel and uh, get each of your thoughts on, uh, you know, what productive, uh, if any, uh, uh, solutions or approaches or policies uh, should be adopted. Uh, uh, Renee, why don't we start with you? You know, in, in Europe, um, European law enforcement has had a lot of success um, by cooperating closely with private researchers and, um, and, and you know, private sector companies. And I know that the FBI has said that they are interested in, in pursuing those kinds of relationships in the US. And I think that, uh, you know, by, by establishing and maintaining those kinds of relationships and, and using the, the expertise of private researchers, um, I think there would be a lot more advances um, towards, you know, identifying criminals, maybe preventing attacks and that sort of sort of thing. Great. Thanks. Uh, Jeff, what do you think? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I mean, even, you know, John, John has said, right, like cybersecurity is, is never a hundred percent secure, but I think, you know, individual companies and um, uh, you know, uh, individuals can, can still take steps to, you know, improve their cybersecurity. I think in this, this, sort of remote working day and age, um, it's sort of in, introduced even more vulnerabilities uh, than ever. And the attack surface is, is uh, you know, ever increased. Um, and so better security and also better backups so that, you know, in the case that you are attacked, um, you can recover fairly quickly um, and not have to pay the ransom. Great, thanks. And John, what do you think? I, I agree with Jeff and Renee. I think those are both really good ways. I'm gonna go a step further. I think Bitcoin, and crypto is sort of the killer app of ransomware. That's the reason why ransomware exists. I see no, I, I, I have struggled with this. I don't see any legitimate use for cryptocurrency in the United States. I don't see any good thing that it does. Um, I, and I, I've studied it carefully. All you ever hear, all the people who promote Bitcoin to me, they always own it. So the more people they can convince to buy it, the better they're gonna do. So I think three fast, easy, inexpensive, reasonable and effective government solutions uh, to combat the ransomware wave that we're in. President Biden should sign an executive order that no federal entity will accept crypto as payment for goods or services or do business with any entity that transacts in crypto. Number two, the IRS should require that crypto transfers of $10,000 or more be reported to the IRS just like the way banks report cash transfers of that amount and brokers report securities transactions to the IRS. And third, FinCEN should require US taxpayers holding more than 10,000 in crypto offshore to file FinCEN form 114, known as the FBAR, to report these holdings. I think the only way to get a chokehold on ransomware is to stop the flow of the Bitcoin. And I don't see any, any reason not to. I, you know. I appreciate, I'm, and don't conflate this with blockchain. I realize blockchain has incredible um, potential and that there are all these businesses that will do all these incredible things with blockchain, but I don't wanna conflate the two. I'm just talking about using this as a currency. We are not in a country where you are supposed to be able to anonymously or pseudo anonymously conduct transactions. We don't live in a country like that. This country requires you, if you go to the bank and you withdraw more than $10,000, there's a report of that. When I was at the SEC, we could trace transactions. That's what this country is about. We don't allow that kind of financial privacy from the government. Of course, you have to get a warrant or you have to use a subpoena, but we don't have freedom of making anonymous transactions and we shouldn't allow it because it fosters terrorism. As far as I can see, Bitcoin is good for two things. One is investment because there might be some other person who's willing to buy it for some reason. And two, as a means of conducting terrorism, ransomware attacks, drug dealing, uh, child pornography, and all the other things that are sold on the dark web. Great, those are really intriguing suggestions. I'll, I'll mention a couple things. Um, you know, at times in the past, uh, in the recent past, uh, 
uh, companies or the government have had some success at uh, disabling the infrastructure of the ransomware gangs, you know, getting at the servers that, that they, they use uh, or getting the host to, to not to use them on the server. Uh, sometimes uh, the, the email providers, you know, they, in order to send a ransom note, you need, to, you need a platform on which to communicate it. And sometimes those uh, email providers have been, uh, uh, have tried to uh, uh, identify if their pro platforms are being used for ransom notes and then try and eliminate those users uh, from, from access. So uh, those are a couple approaches. I'll also mention a shameless plug here. Uh, Renee and I are, are currently uh, writing a book about one uh, private group that's had some success in cracking the ransomware codes for uh, uh, victims so that they don't have to pay the ransom because the, the, the people we're writing about can recover the key. It's, a, it's an all volunteer group around the world of about a dozen people called the ransomware hunting team. So we're doing a book about them and, and their, their story. They, they crack these codes for free. Now, the, most of them cannot be cracked, but if the hacker has made a mistake in some way or uh, uh, they, they sometimes uh, they, they're, they find resourceful ways to, uh, uh, to acquire, to get the key that uh, can get the files uh, opened again. And that, yeah. uh, it's called the ransomware hunting team should come out next year. Yeah, that's uh, cool. We're gonna uh, go back, back to Connor to, to uh, 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 respond to audience questions. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, thanks again for a great, that was a wonderful conversation. Uh, now we're gonna turn it over to the Q&A portion. Um, so again, if you'd like to ask a question, you can click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and type it into us. Um, for starters, uh, I'm gonna begin with one that, uh, you know, was asked by several people um, and it seemed of great concern, but, uh, and I'll direct this to you, John, um, what are some steps individuals can take to uh, protect their data? Oh, that's a great question. I think what I tell a lot of individuals who ask me, the first thing is to work on all your notifications. So you're, you're worried about your credit card transactions and um, different things like that. So you wanna make sure whatever credit card you're using, whatever bank you're using, is giving you all sorts of notifications whenever there's any activity. Because banks and credit card companies, I think have gotten pretty good at dealing with consumers. I think that's, that's number one. Number two, you, you know, it's obvious, keep changing your passwords, um, be very mindful. It's really, it's really impossible to be vigilant all the time. You know, even me who, again, I've been doing cyber since uh, 1992 um, or 1993, you know, occasionally you're going to click on something that you shouldn't and that's frustrating and even no matter how vigilant you are but try to be careful like that um, and take as many steps as you can to think about you know when you're using if you go to if, even these simple things when you go to a hotel don't use their wi-fi only use wi-fi that you think is protected that you think is safe and that's probably your own wi-fi and that's it and don't uh use don't use any personal information on any machine or any device that you're not familiar with. Keep updates on all the patching, on all the security that you're using. Put in all kinds of antivirus and other types of uh, defenses into your systems. Um, the same things that people have been doing forever, just be vigilant. And uh, you know, I think people should be more worried about their private information than about their financial transactions, because I do think, again, the credit card companies and the banks are pretty good at helping you when you've been hit like that. But if you're putting personal things in emails and those emails get picked up um, and then they get suddenly dumped into social media, that's always something to worry about as well. So think about using email, think about using encrypted communications, think about encrypting your data, backing up your data. There are lots of amazing ways to back up your data these days that are incredibly efficient and incredibly cheap. Um, I could go on for a long time. I'm curious to hear what Jeff and Renee have to say and Dan also. Yeah, I, I guess from an individual level, um, I think I think uh, backups definitely are, are very very important. Um, I think um, you know if if a ransomware attacker hits you and you, you know they've got your your data and it's encrypted, and you don't want to pay, um, that's sort of the end of it, right? If you have a backup and you can sort of restore your data and proceed as usual. The the difference between an individual and a company is. Um, you know, you don't, you probably don't have, you know, suppliers, uh, you know, waiting to uh, ship you their product or customers that you need to serve right away. Right. Uh, and so, you know, from a personal individual level, I think 
good backups and keeping it separate from um, your machine um, will at least protect you from sort of having to pay some sort of ransom um, to get to get your data back. Um, data that's you know probably really only important to you personally. Um, Renee, this is a follow up to uh, your your response to the final question about how the extortion and the economy of extortion might be disrupted. Um, can we, can you give an example of how European law enforcement has worked with a private company successfully? Yeah, earlier this year, uh, a group of private researchers had identified the infrastructure of a, a botnet. Uh, called Emotet uh, that was used to spread ransomware. And uh, working together with uh, the Dutch National Police and Europol and a variety of other um, uh, national law enforcement, they took down a good portion of the spot net. You know, of course, the, the caveat there is um, often after a big disruption of, of one of these botnets, and there's been several of them, they'll reform. and continue the same old thing that they were always doing, but it, it, it certainly delivers a blow to them when it, when it happens. Um, and Jeff, uh, how do some governments benefit from the burgeoning ransomware industry um, and how can it be stopped without their cooperation? Yeah, uh, it's, it's an interesting question, I, you know, um... I actually don't have a good handle on sort of how the Russian government, you know, sort of views um, views this, this uh, burgeoning industry within their own borders. Because at the end of the day, it it, it really, I mean, it results in these uh, you know payments flowing from outside of the country's borders into the country, right? Um, so I'm not, you know, I'm I'm actually not sure uh, what what the government how how the government views it. But Dan, if you yeah, know. there's a couple things that maybe could be said on that, which is. A lot of these attackers from uh, Russia, when they uh, launch a ransomware attack, the program includes code that halts the attack if they encounter, uh, you know, Russian language code or uh, in the in the in the victim network or the victim computer because they don't want to attack, uh, you know, systems in their own country, and so uh, you know, from the Russian government's point of view. Uh, if, the, if it's, if it's launched, launched from Russia and it's got protections to make sure that none of the victims are not Russian, uh, I don't think the Russian government considers it a crime or cares very much. They, they might even enjoy the fact that it's, uh, you know, taking money from, uh, you know, Western capitalists. So uh, a lot of the attackers in Russia, you know, they take that precaution in order to stay on decent terms with the Russian government and protect their own uh, nest. Uh, and John, yeah. um, how often are smaller ent entities like uh, utility co-ops and school districts, how often are they targeted for ransomware attacks? Very often. And, um, you know, again, I just know sort of what I work on, but sometimes my weekend, like I'm surprised this weekend, I didn't really get too many calls about this. Um, we talked about looking through the, the doing a Google search. Sometimes people respond to ransomware just by doing a Google search. It's, it's such a new area. So I'll get a call on a Sunday from someone who I, I Googled ransomware and I found you. And that's normally not how I've ever gotten clients before. But there's really just so much desperation. The smaller companies, it can be very tricky because typically they don't have good backups. It's almost like those old like roach motels, you know, the roaches check in, but it doesn't tech check out. That's the same thing that goes for the data. And oftentimes you try to go to your backups. Like I had one small law firm recently that got attacked and they found out that their backup company hadn't been doing their backups the way that they should. So they lost everything. And uh, it's very tough for these smaller firms. I think they don't have the personnel. They don't have the infrastructure. They don't do quarterly testing. Uh, they don't test their backups. Um, so they really don't have the same sort of uh, infrastructure and they get hit. And um, the feeling that I get from most of them is just, well, tell me how to make this payment so I can get back to work. And, um, you know, hopefully they have cyber insurance and their cyber insurer comes in and says, here's how we are going to work the payment scheme out so that we're confident that the, the, the transaction is bona fide. But it's, it's getting different. And, you know, if you look at the Kaseya data breach, uh, the ransomware attack, 
and you look at the CEO, Fred Vicola's uh, YouTube video, he talks a lot about how he worked with DHS and how he worked with the FBI. And I think that is a trend, you know, Renee touched upon it. And um, lawyers are, are sometimes nervous about telling their clients to work with government because the next thing you know, the FBI comes in and looks at everything and finds five other crimes that you're engaged in. So you've now put your client in a worse situation. So nobody likes to invite the FBI or invite, you could invite if you're a government contractor and you invite DHS in, they might say to you, hey, this is a problem. And then you get debarred and you can't do any more government contracting work. So there are risks to doing that. And I was encouraged by the Kaseya CEO. The, the benefits are that you can really stand up and say, hey, we're working closely with law enforcement on every angle. Now expecting law enforcement to get your money back for you, I think that that recovery and colonial pipeline was a bit of a fluke. I reviewed all the documents, the affidavits, and there's, it's not clear how the government obtained the private key to get that. They might have gotten it from, from maybe from one of the, the cryptocurrency trading platforms. I, I don't know. But they need that key in order to access. They can, they can maybe identify where it is. But remember, even if you identify where the criminal is and you identify where the accounts are, you know, when I was at the SEC, extraditing and successfully prosecuting that person or entity is a, it takes 15 different agencies, federal agencies, before you can even just talk to someone in another country, let alone uh, interview them or let alone somehow subpoena them because you don't have any authority. So it's a giant roadblock once anything is in a foreign country and it requires a dragnet of um, of of federal U.S. federal agencies just to get the smallest things done. Regarding uh, uh, school districts, as, as the, the questioner asked, um, there's been a real surge in attacks on schools during the pandemic for the simple reason that they're very vulnerable. Because as we know, a lot of schools went from having in-person classes to having virtual classes. So if you can uh, uh, disable their computer network, they're no, they can no longer conduct education in any way. The, the teachers are cut off from the students. So uh, as, re, as a result, you know, that pressure translates into increased pressure on the school districts to have to pay the ransom. So uh, the gangs uh, saw an opportunity and they seized it and there was a rash of uh, attacks on schools. And Renee, um, riffing off of uh, what John just said about, um, you know, companies maybe being, or consultants maybe being reluctant to go to the FBI and the FBI, you know, not necessarily stepping up to the plate. Um, you know, if they're not up to the task, like who, if anyone is sort of stepping into the breach and, you know, filling this role. And well, like we talked about earlier, um, you know, there's a lot of work being done by, by private, private researchers and private companies, you know, particularly in disrupting botnets. There was an example, um, last year where Microsoft got a court order to disrupt a botnet that was being used to infect victims with Ryuk. Um, you know, and then of course, you know, like Dan mentioned, there's the work of the ransomware hunting team. Um, they've cracked more than 300 major ransomware strains and variants since they've started collaborating. And that's saved about 4 million victims from paying collectively billions of dollars in ransom. Um, you know, it's a really interesting group. Um, they mostly, you know, they have day jobs in cybersecurity, they collaborate on ransomware in their spare time. Um, and they, they, they do it, um, they do it for free. Um, in 2019, we profiled one of its key members, um, um, a really interesting guy named Michael Gillespie, uh, who overcame um, myriad um, personal struggles, cancer, poverty, um, all while dedicating his spare time to cracking ransomware and helping victims. And um, he'll be, um, he'll be further uh, looking at his life story in our, in our upcoming book. Great. And uh, Dan, I'd be curious to hear um, what common vulnerabilities are being exploited and how might local reporters be able to check in and see if those vulnerabilities exist near them? Well, uh, you know, some of the common vulnerabilities exploited are simply, you know, sort of getting in by phishing. You know, some, some hospitals were hit during the pandemic when, uh, you know, employees, despite whatever training they got, clicked on suspicious emails and it, it you know, 
let in the uh, the virus, just like you know hacks always get in, and that's that's a very common method. Uh, for local reporters, uh, it's difficult because if if a uh, if a victim pays the ransom, they generally don't like people to know about it. You know they they feel you know they are in a way abetting crime, and so they feel guilty about it. But I think the best way is. Um, some of the victims are public entities. You know, they may be local governments, local police departments, school districts, as we've discussed, public hospitals. In those cases, uh, sometimes a public in public uh, records requests. Some universities have also been hit. State universities, uh, you can file public records requests to try and get the ransom note, the uh, the transcripts of negotiations with the uh, uh, the, the ransomware gangs. Uh, you know, reports on how they got in. Now. In some cases, uh, it's frustrating because you file this public records request and you, you know they ought to comply with it, but they respond and they say, well, we're, we're not going to comply because there's an ongoing investigation. Well, you know, you and I and, and they know, everybody knows that this investigation probably is not going to lead to any arrest for the reasons we've discussed, but they use that as an excuse. But some places do and some places don't. And sometimes there, you can be creative in the way you use a public records request. For example, in one state, there was an attack on a local hospital, and I couldn't uh, get the, use a public records request with that hospital, but I figured that the hospital had probably reported what had happened to the State Department of Health. So I sent a public records request to the State Department of Health asking for all its uh, uh, you know, communications with the hospital that was hit by ransomware, and sure enough, the, the, the local hospital had filed a report uh, and I was able to get that report and it was very illuminating. It had a lot of details about how the attackers got in. The same way with local school districts, if they've been hit, they may have to tell their state uh, Department of Education. So I recommend a public records request to the state Department of Education uh, as well, because think about who the victims are in touch with. What public entities are they in communication with? And then FOIA those entities and see if you can get the communications. Great. Um, perhaps uh, Renee or John can answer this one. But uh, someone was curious about, um, you know, looking at the economic impact these attacks have had. You know, they've had really big targets in recent weeks. JBS, which is one of the largest uh, food processors, and then the Colonial Pipeline. Um, yeah, is there anyone looking into uh, how ransomware is uh, and what impact it's making on the economy? I, I think I can say I can tell you this that the SEC is incredibly active in this space because the SEC expects all of these companies that are impacted by these attacks to report accurately how it impacts them economically. And the SEC did something incredibly unique just a, a few weeks ago where they literally reached out to a whole bunch of companies who were apparently impacted by the solar winds attack. And they said to those companies, hey, if you botched, if you made a mistake in the way that you in your public filings uh, disclosed the impact, especially the financial impact upon your business of the solar winds hack, we're going to give you amnesty up until I think it was a date in July. It might be today, uh, July 6th. I can't remember what the letter said, but they literally, for the first time I'd ever seen, they offered people amnesty if they would correct their filings. So there is an expectation, I think, um, that companies figure out the economic impact and that they disclose that potential. And this latest Kaseya, you'll see that though, any of those companies that are public companies and have this situation, they're going to have to figure out what the economics are. So the SEC is pressuring companies very intensely to figure out the economic impact of these ransomware attacks. Yeah, and to, to add on to that, um, you know, we we reported in 2019 about how company, pu publicly traded companies have been reluctant to report that they've been victim because, you know, of course, uh, an attack, a uh, ransomware attack might show, you know, shows that you've been vulnerable and that's not necessarily something that you want to disclose to the public or that you want investors to know. Um, you know, instead, they'd use all manner of euphemisms. Um, we've had a, an incident or, you know, a cyber event or, you know, this or that. And, um, you know, the question came up of whether, you know, this is this is enough as far as the SEC is concerned. Um, you know, on on just more broadly about the the entire, you know, the more kind of global economic impact of ransomware, you know, the impact, um, you know, in, in the US economy. 
an entire ecosystem of incident responders and insurers, data recovery firms, lawyers have cropped up around responding to ransomware. And somebody that I talked with regularly put it in a way that I, I thought was um, kind of interesting, which was, you know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with those kind of fake motivational po posters. You sort of see them as memes sometimes, but um, uh, it, 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 there's one that's like consulting and, um, you know, there's, you know, a picture of all these consultants sitting around and the, the, the punchline of it was, if you can't solve the problem, help prolong it. And there's, you know, they think there's a serious question of whether all of the people that have come around the ransomware response space are prolonging the problem by continuing to pay ransoms and be a part part of the, you know, ongoing prolonged response. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I think this will be our last one. Uh, Dan, can you please speak to, uh, you know, kind of give a, uh, an overview of the different, just the different kinds of targets um, and the different levels of sophistication of ransomware attacks. Um, so, you know, which might be considered low hanging fruit with uh, sort of simple preventable steps and which are, you know, more sophisticated and might require like an active defense. Uh, sure. Uh, well, in terms of the, the beginning of that question, I mean, it might be easier to shorter list of places that aren't targeted than, than the ones that are. I mean, uh, ransomware, uh, gangs are targeting pretty much every sector, as we've discussed and have we, as we've seen. I mean, in the, the pandemic, obviously, they targeted a lot of uh, hospitals and schools that were particularly vulnerable, uh, a lot of universities, uh, all kinds of different uh, uh, businesses. Uh, they still continue to target individuals. And yes, there is a big range of so sophistication. I mean, you'll get, uh, you know, a uh, a teenager who buys a you know ransomware kit off the shelf on the dark web and uh, you know the code may be full of mistakes and uh, they, they attack uh, for a small amount of money they they do what used to be called the uh, spray and pray approach of you know just sort of indiscriminately targeting uh, hundreds of thousands of places uh, uh, hoping to, to you know break into some and get some money with small amounts of money to the places that the, the, you know, the, the experienced gangs, uh, like the ones Jeff discussed that are well organized, they, they do a fair amount of preliminary research. You know, they'll identify a target, they'll get in there, they'll look to see how much the, uh, the, the cyber insurance coverage is, they'll look for potentially compromising information that might force the, the, the CEO or the board to just decide to pay the ransom. Uh, and then they'll use a very sophisticated code that, uh, uh, you know, they're developers who might be, you know, computer science uh, graduates and in, in underemployed in, in Russia or, or Ukraine have, have you know, worked hard on perfecting and making sure they don't have any mistakes. They'll, they'll launch that and uh, uh, then the, and they'll demand, uh, uh, they'll, they'll pick a demand that is maybe not quite enough to bankrupt the company, but it's certainly the maximum they think that the victim can afford. And uh, it's a very high-powered, sophisticated, well-researched attack that uh, leaves of, often leaves a victim in the dire straits. And then uh, some of them are more professional than others in regards to negotiating. You know, if they demand $30 million and the company comes back and says, you know, we'll pay you $5 million, you know, some of these uh, ransomware gangs are very good at negotiating. They're, they're ruthless. They're hard-hearted. They, they stick to the point. They, they won't be deterred and uh, they post samples of the data they've stolen on the web to uh, on the dark web to, to show that they mean business and uh, uh, they're every bit a match for the negotiators that the, the victims are uh, hiring. So uh, it can be a very sophisticated high stakes uh, uh, conflict. All right, well, that's our time for today. Uh, I wanna thank our panelists, Renee Dudley, John Reed Stark, and Jeff Cow for this excellent conversation and our moderator, Daniel Golden. And thank you to our audience for joining us today and for all of your thoughtful questions. Um, again, this event has been recorded. So you'll receive an email tomorrow with the full video of today's event to everyone who registered. Um, we will also post this recording on our YouTube channel. So from all of us at ProPublica, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.